Okay, hello everybody. I'm going to explain to you how the CMOS Schmidt trigger works and how it, how, uh, in, from which part the positive feedback comes. I tried to find something about this on the internet, but I never could find something about this. So in the end, I just looked at what happened step by step in a simulator. And finally, after hours of of uh, looking at all the notes, I could I found uh, how the CMOS Schmidt trigger works. So hopefully, I will be able to explain to you how I how the Schmidt trigger works. So let's go. So first of all, I will I'm going to assume that you have seen how the CMOS inverter works and that you also understand how the inverter works. And secondly. I just want to give you a small trick that helped me a lot in understanding the circuit. So there is a reason I did not draw the arrows as you usually do for PMOS and NMOS. And that's because I think it's, it's more helpful to think about the transistors as symmetrical objects because they are symmetrical. And so an analysis I do a lot of times is saying that the NMOS conducts if the gate voltage is higher than one of the other voltages. So this conducts if Vg is bigger than Vs or Vd. And the same can be said about PMOS, but inverse. So the PMOS conducts if the gate voltage is smaller than one of the voltages. And this is a trick I will use a lot of times, and I think it's a very helpful trick. So this is the CMOS Schmidt trigger. It has six transistors. Uh, this transistor is connected to the ground, and this transistor is connected to the, to the supply voltage. And let's start with, let's start very simply by saying that V in is 3.3 uh, volts. In that case, V out is zero volts because we are working with a inverter. So this will be 3.3, this will be zero volt. And so one thing you can immediately notice is that because this is zero volts, this also has to be zero volts because this voltage has to be in between zero volts and zero volts. So it cannot be anything else than zero volt. And you'll also notice that V in, which is the gate voltage of these two N masses, is very very high 3.3 volts and it is much higher than either of these terminals and so these and muscles are conducting so it's like a short circuit also here for this uh, and mass zero volts is not much bigger than one of these um, voltages and so this will not be conducting so for so to simplify it, and one more thing I want you to notice is that this is zero volts, this is zero volts. So we can pretty much draw this. And this is just a diode connected PMOS. So in other words, I can just replace that PMOS by just a diode here. And the rest of the circuit uh, doesn't matter for now. You can uh, ignore this for now, but the rest of the circuit doesn't matter for now because they're short-circuited anyway. So now that we have drawn the diode here, we can we are interested in what this voltage is. So I'm going to call this voltage V1. And let's say this is 3.3 volts. Now let's make some guesses, right? If V1 is uh, 1.5 volt, let's say, then the voltage across this diode will be huge, which will give a very, very big I2. Okay, very big current. And this current has to come from somewhere, which means that I1 will also be very high. And because I1 is high, then this voltage, so the, let's call it the, the um, source drain voltage of of uh, M1 will also be very high 
and this will lower V1. So obviously this is not, having 1.5 volts as V1 is not a stable state. And so you can do this analysis until V1 is 0.7 volts, because in that case your diode will just not be conducting. It will be on the, on the verge of conducting. So this is also what you will find in a simulator, that this node is 0.7 volts. And we can then look at this voltage, so the source gate voltage of um, transistor 2, of, NMOS, of uh, PMOS 2, and that is equal to V1 minus 3.3 uh, volts, which is minus 2.6 volts, so it's highly unconducting. So uh, not conducting. And this is important for our next step. So we have seen that this is a diode connected. So this this is zero volts. So see, this is a this is always in saturation. And we have seen that this is uh, not conducting when V in is high enough. And so we want to see what happens when we decrease V in. Right. So if I find, if I make an approximation, if I assume something about these transistors and I find a solution and I check the assumptions and they're correct, then I can assume that the solution I found is the correct, correct one. So I'll make two assumptions, which we have to verify later. And so the first assumption is that M2 is not conducting, which is not far fetched because we have seen that it is not conducting here. And I will also assume that M1 and M3 are in saturation. Now, M3 is always in saturation. As long as this is zero volts, this will be a diode connected transistor, which will always, it's just always in saturation. So we just have to check if M1 is in saturation. So going by the um, assumption that M2 is not conducting, it means that all the current passing here will pass through there. Let's call that I. Now, I will also assume that these PMOS transistors are the same. And if we draw the source drain voltage of these transistors, because we are in saturation, we are in this region, and in this region, the current only depends on the source gate voltage and not on the source drain voltage. And because these are the same transistors and the same current passes through them, it means that the source gate voltages of these transistors need to be the same. So if we just write that down, so VSG1 is VSG3, you can find then, by using these two voltages, that V1 is 3.3 volts minus V in. So this is a very important result. So as you increase V in, V1 will go down. And so we have to check if this is still in saturation. So I can calculate quickly VSG1 is... Uh, VSG1 is 3.3 volts minus V in, and VSD1 is, you can check for yourself, is V in. Now we are in saturation if um, VSD1 is greater than VSG1 minus VT. And Vt here is the threshold voltage, which I'll take as 0 0.7 volts. And if you, let's uh, quickly solve this. So this means that Vs, Vsd1 is V in, has to be greater than 3.3 volts minus V in minus 0 0.7 volts. And putting V in at one side gives you that V in has to be greater than 1.3 volts. So as long as Vn is greater than 1.3 volts, this will be in saturation. So that's assumption uh, 2 taken care of. Now we have to still check that 
M2 is not conducting. So we have to just check that this source gate voltage is high enough. Or that it's uh, low enough. If it's low enough, it will not be conducting. So let's... I quickly have to turn the page around because I have no more space. So VSG2... Oh, sorry. VSG2 is equal to V1 minus V in. So VSG2 is V1 minus V in, which is equal to 3.3 volts minus 2 V in. And that has to be smaller than 0.7 volts in order for it not to be conducting. And so V in has to be greater than 1.3 volts. So two times we find that the same voltages make sure that um, satisfy both assumptions. And once you can also see that this number is smaller than your standard inverter uh, threshold which is about uh, VDD divided by 2, so 1.65 volts. And as this number is smaller, it means that your state will change later. And that is what will give the hysteresis in the CMOS Schmidt trigger. Okay, so now we made the preliminary analysis. Now we can go back to the big picture. So to recap, V1 which is this voltage, is 3.3 volts minus V in. And so when V in is 1.3 volts, this will be 2 volts, and the voltage over this gate, over the, the source gate voltage, will be 0.7 volts, which will, which will be just enough to start conduction. And so you will get a small current going here, which will also which will keep going down. And this small current is going to start the explosion. So the explosion will not come from the current coming from here, but it will come from this current, as I will show you now. So you've got a small current coming here. And um, let's call this voltage two. And let's assume that we have, we have lowered the voltage a bit, right? So, in that case, if you do some simulations, you will see that V2 is 0.1 volts and V out is uh, 0.2 volts when it uh, starts switching. All right, so this is 0.1 volts, this is 0.2 volts. Which means that, so, so because the current is flowing here, these uh, transistors can be seen as resistors. Right. Resistors that depend on on the gate source voltage. And because a current is coming through here, it means that a voltage has to be over these resistors. And that is what will uh, make V2 and V out increase. Now, if you make this low enough, then this voltage, right now this voltage is V out minus V2, which is 0 0.1 volts. Now, this voltage here, it's 3.3 volts minus 0 0.1 volts, that's 3.2 volts, this is huge. So a small source gate voltage will already give a pretty large current. So let's call that uh, I4, I guess, let's call it I4. And let's call this I1 and this I2, whatever. So because this I4 has to go somewhere, it goes to here. So I4 is bigger, which makes I2 go bigger. And because this is a resistor, it makes V2 go higher, and it makes V out go higher too, because you still got this current here. So in the first place, V out minus V2 is not getting larger, because they are they're going up and down at the same time. And so this current will not go bigger, but you have to remember something, and that is the fact that this voltage is 1.1 volts, but this voltage now is a bit less. Let's say, um, well, because let's say that due to this current, this voltage has gone down to 0 0.9 volts, right? If we draw some IVDS diagrams, 
you will see that to get the same current, because the same current goes through these two branches, to get the same current, this is VGS is one, you know, 0 0.9 volts, and this is VGS is 1.1 volts. And to get the same current, you need a much bigger VDS over this. Or in other words, this resistor, let's call it R2, this R1. So, because V2 goes larger, R2 goes larger. And then to get the same, to get the same current, you need a bigger voltage. So to recap, I4 goes bigger, which makes I2 go bigger, which makes V2 go higher, which makes R2 go bigger, right? And this also makes V out go bigger. But because R2 also goes bigger and you still have this small current coming from there, it means that V out also goes bigger. So you have, you have like a double double V out going bigger. And so V out minus V2 is also getting larger, which means that the current here goes even larger. Right? I4 is even larger. And you see, an increase in I4 causes an increase in I4. And this is, exactly, this is just the definition of positive feedback. And so this will continue until you reach the a stable state and the stable state is reached when v out is 3.3 volts so um, when v out is 3.3 volts you can find that that um when this is 3.3 volts you find that these are just short circuited and then you have exactly the same rules as before where you can find that um yeah, so when you have reached the next stable state, you will find that this is not conducting. And so this gate source voltage has to be equal to this gate source, has to be equal to, um, sorry, this gate source voltage. And so in our case, uh, V in, which is this gate source voltage, has to be equal to V out, which is now 3.3 volts because we have switched minus uh, V2 and so V2 is equal to 3.3 volts minus V and so it's exactly the same rules as before and it's uh, instead of working with the P masses you work with the N masses and then you can increase V1 now and it will not flip back because we are in hysteresis so you'll have to flip it back to approximately 2.2 volts to uh, to get the the triggering the Schmidt triggering so I hope this uh, video has been helpful to you guys. And uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you.